mind and body, and they empower the warrior to face life or death with equal calm and resolve. Now, as never before seen, watch as the ancient teachings, practices, and rituals surrounding the world's most awesome martial arts are revealed in The Secrets of the Warrior's Power. According to martial arts legend, in 1566, a band of English traders turned for shelter to a Buddhist monastery at the foot of the Songshan Mountains in the Henan province of northern China. The name of the monastery was the Shaolin Temple. Inside the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas were the elite martial arts warriors of China, the soldier monks of Shaolin, engaged in a spectacle that was unlike anything these Westerners had seen before. But in the climate of dynastic intrigue and repression that characterized the dying days of the Ming Dynasty, the martial techniques under practice were a closely guarded secret. Questioned by the traders, their guide would offer only one explanation. Kung Fu, he said. They are training to master an art. The films of Bruce Lee and others brought Chinese Kung Fu to audiences of millions worldwide. Today, the term Kung Fu is synonymous with the traditional fighting arts of China, arts that many believe are the basis of all of the Asian fighting systems. When compared to Korean Taekwondo or Japanese Karate, for example, some of the differences are easily visible. Kung Fu is generally distinguished by more fluid movements, an emphasis on learning many weapons, and its colorful traditional dress. It is, some believe, the most beautiful of all the martial arts. But save for an initiated few, the true nature of Kung Fu remains a mystery. It began with one man, a Buddhist monk, the third son of a Brahmin Indian king. His name was Bodhidharma. In 527 AD, Bodhidharma went to China to the court of the Chinese Emperor Wu. Buddhism, he learned, had been tampered with. It was no longer just an internal mental act of devoting oneself to Buddha, but one that now took specified public acts of devotion. Rituals involving calligraphy, the adornment of shrines, and the building of tributes honoring Buddha. When the emperor asked for Bodhidharma's reaction to the great temples and shrines he constructed to honor Buddha, Bodhidharma replied, these are but as shadows of the forest. They are empty and have no substance. Bodhidharma would have to tackle the problem at its source, the legendary Shaolin Temple in northern China. There are two schools of thought on what happened after Bodhidharma left the emperor's court. One is that he went to the Shaolin Temple and he found them so secularized, so worried about money and worldly things that he left them in disgust. He refused to teach them his special muscle changes philosophy, which blends mind and body harmony in the martial arts that we know today. He goes off to a cave, he stares at a wall for nine years. The second school of thought is that instead of going to the Shouting Temple first, he just went to the cave, 
stayed there for nine years meditating while disciples came seeking attention until he found a disciple worthy of the information he had to impart. In the 10th year, in a bid to become his first disciple, a monk severed his left arm. His act was the first evidence that Bodhidharma's message had been understood. What mattered was not the external, but the internal. Bodhidharma rose to the side of his first disciple, in whose honor the Shaolin monks would from then on salute Buddha with only one hand. It was time for the teachings to begin. Bodhidharma was a proponent of the concept of chi, the vital energy or essence or life force that we all hold within us. This is a primary concept that's held within the Chan Buddhistic school of thought, or Zen Buddhism as we know it in the West. This chi, or vital essence, could be focused within, taking that inner focus and developing it through mental, spiritual, and physical discipline, which we know as the martial arts. You could aim that energy toward parts of your body. He called this linking energy. And then he could explode that energy into a part of his body for healing purposes, perhaps. That would be called exploding energy. This interworking with the chi is a very important part of all Chinese martial arts and the essence of the peaceful interdisciplinary aspect of martial arts worldwide. Through Bodhidharma at Shaolin, the theory was it would be possible to maximize external physical strength by maximizing internal strength, the flow of the chi. For the monks of Shaolin, this meant one thing, survival. Throughout the temple's history, the monks had faced what appeared to be an irreconcilable conflict. They had to defend themselves against the threats posed by constantly shifting political alliances, while at the same time preserving the spiritual harmony that defined a life dedicated to Buddha. If Bodhidharma's beliefs and teachings about Qi were accurate, the monks' ability to worship was also the basis of their ability to ward off aggressors. That was the theory. The question was, would Bodhidharma's theory work? In medicine, the existence of this unifying force, or Qi, has long formed a very basis for the practice of acupuncture. In 652 AD, Sun Shumao found that Qi flowed along precise meridians between the body's organs. Using tiny electrical charges generated by acupuncture stimulation, he could affect this energy field and redress imbalances, remove blockages, and ultimately heal patients. For contemporary Kung Fu practitioners, the existence of Qi has never been under question. When properly focused, this is the energy that enables them to transcend the physical limitations of flesh and blood and perform feats that appear to challenge the impossible. In the 20th century, the advent of electromagnetic imaging technologies enabled Chinese scientists to gather proof of Qi's existence. The monks of the 6th century Shaolin Temple, though, could not turn to science. They had to put Bodhidharma's theory to the test. To maximize Qi, they meditated. To maximize linking energy, they practiced a form which became known as the Lohan, a series of 18 unique movements that, when combined with the right breathing technique, refined mind-body coordination. To develop explosive energy, they followed a training regimen of unparalleled severity, a regimen with one objective, to create a warrior whose resolve 
no aggressor could disturb. The tests of the Shaolin were no less extreme. The final test, given before a monk was allowed to become an emissary of the temple, was known formally as the Hall of the Wooden Men, to the monks as the Corridor of Death. It was a test in which monks who lacked the capacity to defend themselves and their temple died an often painful death. The test consisted of a long corridor lined with 108 mechanical dummies primed to randomly release weapons with deadly precision and force. Blocking the exit sat a burning 300-pound cauldron. For those who reached the cauldron, the reward was the intense pain of burning flesh and the indelible brands of the Shaolin. A tiger on one arm and a dragon on the other. To survive was a victory of the Qi. The annals of Chinese history testify eloquently to the effectiveness of the Shaolin martial arts. And for more than 400 years, the temple prospered, but the political climate eventually shifted. Their techniques became something of a threat to the political powers of the day. By 1570, the Manchus decided either the Shaolin monks were going to fall in line and tell them that they would serve them or there'd be a problem. Shaolin monks neglected to respond in time and the Manchu forces came and obliterated the temple. The monks who survived went underground to keep the fighting arts alive and formed the secret societies known as the Triads. For the next 300 years, the Triads became a focal point for political resistance. Arts came in the 20th century during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. With the rise of communism, the Chinese government under Mao Zedong denounced all practice of the martial arts as futile and superstitious. Practitioners faced brutality at best. At worst, execution. Seeking refuge, many fled to Hong Kong. There, it is believed, Kung Fu would have died, and the teachings of Bodhidharma remained the property of myth, if not for a man named Run Run Shaw. For an investment of $100,000, Shaw discovered, you could capture the heretofore secretive action of Chinese Kung Fu on film and recoup a seven-figure profit. As the secrets of the masters were transferred to celluloid, Shaw Brothers Studios went on to become the largest motion picture company in Hong Kong. For traditionalist masters such as Yip Man, these films were not well regarded. Where he had taught that the secrets of Kung Fu had to be learned through a process of mastery, they could now be bought for the price of a ticket. But it was one of Yip Man's students who became arguably the most popular martial arts film star ever. A Chinese-American, Bruce Lee. Chinese Kung Fu. Bruce Lee epitomized the new kung fu of the movie house. But he also broke the mold. Lee hungered for knowledge and delved deeper into the philosophies that underpinned his ability. Bruce Lee had a dynamic stage presence, so it's easy to forget some personal aspects of his life. He actually had 3,000 books or more in his library, all of which he read. He was a philosophy major at the University of Washington. He combined his standard westernized traditional philosophy background with the philosophy background he'd been born and lived with of his own culture, the Eastern background. And you see this combination of East and West in his films and his books. 
At age 27, Lee's beliefs took shape. He broke with Yip Man to form a new martial art. It was called Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist. Unlike the traditional martial arts, Jeet Kune Do had no rules or classifications, yet it shared many of their stances and techniques. It offered the warrior freedom from the confines of style, enabling him to respond better and faster in combat. For Lee, the same philosophy applied to his teaching. I cannot teach you, Lee told his students. I can only help you explore yourselves. But Lee was not alone in keeping alive the spirit of the arts. The year was 1978, and the Beijing police were at an impasse. China's triad gangs, their martial techniques intact, had resurfaced with a criminal focus and appeared to threaten the very rule of law. Powerless to stop them since handguns had been banned, the police turned to their last resort, Pan Ching Fu. The man who at the age of 30 had already been a national legend for nearly 20 years. Thanks to him, 23 triad gang leaders were brought to justice. Some, Grandmaster Pan captured single-handedly. Pan didn't just know the gangster's techniques. He had one they couldn't counter. Like the monks of the Shaolin, Pan trains in what is known as the iron body style of Kung Fu. The monks developed iron body training to focus and intensify their chi, to harden their bodies. By punching or hitting an object with increasing force hundreds of times every day, eventually, it is said, the body becomes like iron itself. For over 38 years, Master Pan has trained his iron fist by hitting a steel block 1,000 times a day. Now, anything less than steel would shatter. How very, very useful. It's very just useful. One just one okay. punch and they are unconscious, for just sure. I only power. use about 30% power. Because it's very strong, very hot. And I, I have power, speed of power. Although he is quite comfortable now in his home in Canada, Master Pan's life was much more difficult as a youngster, orphaned at the age of six and living in the crime-ridden city of Qingtao. Pan needed a means of protecting his younger brother and sister. He turned to the Zen Buddhist principles articulated 13 centuries earlier at Shaolin. It wasn't long before he earned the nickname Shaolahu, or small tiger, because of his skill and aggressiveness. After studying with 15 masters, he went on to teach eventually becoming the lead national coach of the People's Republic of China and one of China's most respected martial artists. Pan has other names, including the Eagle Claw and Sifu Pan, but the most common comes from the 1990 cult martial arts feature Iron and Silk. To audiences worldwide, he is known from that film as the Iron Fist. Couched in the title of Iron and Silk is one of the great secrets of Kung Fu, the secret of yin and yang, female and male. It is known as the principle of opposites. Heat cannot exist without cold. To have light, there must be dark. Ultimately, the theory goes, they become one in the same. According to the Chinese, yin is the soft, passive, negative force. Yang, the hard, active, positive one. Part of Pan Ching Fu's power rests on his ability to summon both at will. Power 
speed and power and accuracy. Master Pan's Every power also comes from continuous, rigorous training. To maintain flexibility, daily stretching for nearly every part of his body is a necessity. This stretching, plus placing 200 pounds of steel on his extended legs every day, helps him stay limber and cultivate what Bodhidharma called the linking energy needed for chi. Must be to your best. Do you understand? Yes, yes sir! Go on! Master Pan also teaches the explosive energy that maximizes the student's capacity to deliver the chi. As in most Kung Fu schools, strict discipline goes hand in hand with a close camaraderie. Neck, grab shoulder. The self-defense techniques of Kung Fu, developed from centuries of practical application, are simple yet effective. They can stop nearly every opponent in his tracks. If it doesn't hurt, you're probably doing something wrong. Students also learn many mixed weapons forms, such as the long army lance and spear, and the staff and spear. The spear is a weapon as ancient as Chinese culture itself. Master it is a milestone for the aspiring disciple. The Chinese spear, both in 9 and 18 foot lengths, combined a thrusting point with a slicing blade. It was a devastating weapon. For foot soldiers, it was one of the last defenses against oncoming cavalry. In the 1800s, the British acknowledged its superiority over their bayonet. The Tai Chi sword, a lesser known component of the popular art of Tai Chi Chuan. And the double broadsword forms. Spinning swords that can turn a man into a windmill of death. Sword is one of the most widely used weapons in Kung Fu. Light and maneuverable, it evolved from the long handled knives the Chinese used before 200 AD. The brightly colored silk scarves are not only ornamental, they confuse and distract one's opponent. The broadsword has only one cutting edge. The warrior that advances with it must also be prepared to defend himself. The blade of the broadsword can easily cut through a coat of armor and the adversary within. Open stomach very easily. Take it, head off. Yeah, quickly. The chain whip, complete with metal barbs and easily enclosed in a hand or garment, first presents the yin of defenselessness, then the yang of the surprise assault. The weighted end of the spinning chain can exceed speeds of 170 miles per hour. All of these, both empty-handed and weapons forms, heighten the student's mind-body coordination. As with the Shaolin monks, the culmination of practice for Pan and his students is control over the Qi. One of the most challenging and difficult regiments Master Pan teaches is the Kung Fu breakfall form. 
The break fall form builds suppleness and pliability, so the warrior can attack like iron, yet land without injury like silk. Again, the yin and yang. Because of the many dedicated Kung Fu practitioners, Master Pan and others, there's been a surge of new interest in the Chinese martial arts. The epicenter of that movement, it appears, is still rooted in Shaolin. Auspices of the government has been declared a national treasure. Once again, it is the testing ground for the teachings of Bodhidharma, a testing ground whose rigor has changed little over the millennium. Part of the Kung Fu training regimen involves strengthening the muscles and toughening the body through repeated exercises. To strengthen the neck muscles, the Shaolin warrior may hang himself for 30 minutes or more at a time. Other regimens to develop the chi are no less difficult. Headbutting helps the Shaolin monks toughen their skulls. Resisting blows to the abdomen, where the chi is said to reside, builds internal strength and focus. It can take as little as eight pounds of pressure to crack the human skull. Skillful manipulation of his chi, though, prevents this monk from getting hurt. This is the art of hard qigong. For the monks, as well as many traditional Chinese masters, hard qigong is an art form still widely practiced today. By focusing his chi, this master is able to make his body impervious to the blade of the sword, just as his warrior ancestors did thousands of years earlier. For over 15 centuries, the skill of hard qigong has protected the monks of Shaolin from assault. But a new assailant has emerged for which the techniques of Bodhidharma are ill-equipped. The tourist. Glorified by the media, the Shaolin temple, still a holy shrine and monastery, has become a popular attraction. However, like countless times before, the ancient principles of Kung Fu are adapting and surviving, this time by moving to the new world, New York City. It is here in downtown Manhattan that Chinese monk Shi Yanming has opened the USA Shaolin Temple. To those who hunger for knowledge, he teaches the values and martial arts made famous at Shaolin. Monk Shi Yanming began his 25-year study of Chan Buddhism and Shaolin Kung Fu at the age of five. In 1992, he came to the United States. His motives, he believes, were those of Bodhidharma 15 centuries ago. I want to stay here and teach Chinese Buddhism, Chinese culture, and Shaolin martial arts, and I want to help promote world peace. Though New York City may seem like one of the last places he would like to teach his arts, monk Shi Yanming is quite content. As he says, 
the whole world is home to a Buddhist monk. The Shaolin martial arts belong to everyone. But China remains the source. Long term, he hopes to build a larger school and set up a cultural exchange with the Shaolin Temple in northern China. Another hope lies with teachers such as Florida resident Grandmaster Chan Poi, a 33rd disciple of the Shaolin Temple, uniquely honored by an engraved stone at the temple itself. Grandmaster Chan defines his life's work in terms of a simple relationship, that of the Sifu, or master, and his disciple, a relationship whose bonds are often closer than that of family, and a relationship that transcends race and nationality. This bond between Sifu and disciple is what links the contemporary student to an ancient chain of warriors, warriors dedicated to perfecting their art. It is an art founded on principles of honor and respect. But for the traditions to survive, the Sifu must find the right disciples, disciples to whom he can entrust the deepest of secrets. Of these secrets, the most notorious is the death touch, the elusive dim muck. That's talking 1947. My master was 79 years old. He had no choice but to use the dim muck. His challenger was a powerful master in the Yang style, only 40 years old. The dim muck is very real. For two years, Wei Yong had taunted the aging grandmaster Chan Li trying to draw him into a physical confrontation. Repeatedly, the Grand Master had refused to fight. But this time, there was no avoiding it. The public challenge had come, and it was time for a public response. Lee's movements were slow as he rose in acceptance of the challenge. Then, without perceptible effort, he struck. It was the dim mock, the death touch. To the unknowing, it seemed like a tap. To the initiate, it was a movement that harnessed Lee's chi and drove it into the core of Jung's body. With that one strike, it was over. Jung never walked again. Bodhidharma's theory of being able to focus your chi to such an extent that you can heal your own body finds physical application in the art of dim mock. There are pressure points, it's a medical fact, that one can touch and cause unconsciousness. It is a healing power or an offensive power. The dim mock technique is presumed to have come from the Chinese art of qian shui, or spotting, attacking the body's vital points. The premise is simple. If one's qi can be controlled within the confines of the body, it can be directed as the ultimate defense outside of the body to short circuit an opponent's nervous system and injure internal organs. For Chan to consider teaching a technique such as the dim mock to any of his disciples, the training they must undergo is no less arduous than it was for the first pupil of Bodhidharma. Grandmaster Chan's style of praying mantis kung fu is elaborate and complex. It consists of more than 72 basic movements combined in an infinite number of ways. These combinations are known as the empty-handed forms. They are the foundation for all other techniques. Weapons, again, are added to increase the training's complexity. The disciple must gain absolute control of the weapon, trust the weapon as an extension of the hand, and execute weapon-based forms as though they were empty-handed. For the advanced pupil, armed forms present the ultimate test of mind-body coordination. Disciples train for months on end, sometimes for years, to master a single form.
There is a saying that to gain proficiency in forms such as Fan Chi takes three years of continuous training. To gain mastery, another nine. In ancient China, choosing the weapons was a right left to the challenger. The more weapons the warrior mastered, the better his chances of surviving a confrontation, especially a challenge to the death. The formidable double hammers wielded by a worthy warrior could swiftly crush the bones of an adversary. Other weapons were less obvious. The fan, traditionally a symbol of grace and gentility, could, in the hands of the right master, decide the outcome of a fight. One of the most noble of weapons is the Quan Do. Quan, referring to the famous 4th century strategist General Quan who created it. And Do, meaning sword. The original weapon was very heavy, sometimes upward of 50 pounds, and fashioned entirely from hand. Its five foot reach and weight was designed for use on horseback to make it easy to sever an opponent's limb or head. Eventually, as wood replaced the metal shaft, the Quando became lighter, and like its cousin, the Long Army Lance, it became a popular weapon among foot soldiers. The Long Army Lance did not share the Quando's nobility. Its chief use, to slice off the legs of the enemy's horses. In combat, a slight inaccuracy can mean the difference between life and death. And it is when the warrior faces multiple opponents that the odds are at their highest. Students of traditional Kung Fu learn a minimum of 18 weapons. Grandmaster Chan, an authority on Chinese weapons, teaches 46. Grandmaster Chan's own regimen includes training in more than a dozen series of movements or forms every day. It's a regimen that has changed little since he emigrated to the United States in 1960. Grandmaster Chan also trains on the plum flower posts. Long a secretive kung fu technique of the Shaolin, practicing and fighting atop these plum flower posts helped the monks develop a keener sense of balance, agility, and leg strength. In ancient China, Sharpened bamboo stakes were sometimes embedded in the ground below. The fighter who lost his balance oftentimes lost his life. Who teaches students violence, violence that is seen all too often in the cinema. Yet Kung Fu masters in both East and West suggest otherwise. Master Dennis Brown, another master in Shaolin Kung Fu, works with students from all walks of life, including those from the inner city at his school just outside of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. In Brown's view, people in the inner city environments of the West face a similar set of circumstances to the monks of Shaolin. They are searching for enlightenment, for freedom, and escape from some of the outrages of their fortune. One means is the freedom offered by drugs. Another means is stepping outside the law, possibly as the member of a gang. An alternative, Master Brown believes, is to study Kung Fu. I came up thinking that uh, you never use your skills um, unless it's absolutely necessary. I kind of teach in the school as I was taught that that is the lowest level of self-defense. First, you should be able to avoid conflict, just not be in situations that are gonna, uh, you know, cause conflicts. Just don't carry yourself in that way. If you find yourself in that situation, then try to get away from it, to avoid it. Go out the back door, go around the street, cross the street, anything. There's no, no shame in that. To help students begin their journey, Brown first takes them back to the primordial, teaching them some of the oldest secrets of Kung Fu, fighting forms perfected in the animal kingdom. Okay, so the Shaolin system has many different animals. You'll, you'll hear people talk about everything from the duck to the, to the monkey system. 
These animal forms are modeled after the movements of some of nature's fiercest fighters. Step out for a second, let me show you. Step forward and punch. Again, you would carry over here with the strike to the eyes, to the throat. Eagle's claw. Eagle's claw. Make sure that it locks back, it grabs in. Step out for a second. Everybody hold it and you watch. Stand up. It's not a grab to the throat, not just squeezing the throat, but reaching in, grabbing with just the fingertips, just here, so that you reach in, pull out on the throat. You see? Not squeezing the back of the neck, squeezing in. So it goes in. It looks just like an eagle's claw. Rolls up and down. Everybody understand? Yes, yes sir. Once again. Ready? So. One. Eagle's claw. Two. Tiger's claw. Tiger claw. Step out for a second. Tiger's claw is not a scratch. We didn't say cat's claw. We said tiger's claw, which means that you come in, you strike up with the heel palm first, then rake down, cross the eyes. You see, so the entire movement is a strike up and down. So the movement is up. There is more to the movements than just technique. Go back to the ready. Tiger movements, for example, develop bones, tendons, and muscles. They are executed with piercing eyes and quiet determination. Breathing is slow and deep. The snake movements teach endurance and the patience to achieve one's goal. For Master Brown, as expressed by American author and black belt John Donahoe, the martial arts build rather than erode the relationship between the individual and the society. That, Master Brown says, is accomplished through training. The same thing that's made Kung Fu popular, the movies, the media, uh, that image of the kung fu guy flying across the screen and taking a guy's head off and that type thing. Uh, in a sense, uh, the whole Bruce Lee era helped to bring martial arts to the forefront to get a lot of people involved in the martial arts. So in that sense, it was very good. But at the same time, the image that was projected was just that it was just about fighting. And it's, it's, it's a lot more than that. Martial arts is a way of life. It's a tool for teaching you self-awareness, self-confidence, for building character, we teach discipline. There's very few places you can go anywhere anymore where you hear kids saying, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, and they learn character values here. Like the monks of Shaolin, Master Brown also teaches students an age-old code of honor and respect, a code he has adapted to meet the needs of a Western oh, urban Move. environment. Starting with the right fist. Move. Strong, Kung Fu stance, keep the back straight. Left but to ingrain it in students so it will follow them the rest of their lives, Kung Fu instructors have got to make them see that their true essence, what's inside of them, is all they need to achieve freedom and enlightenment. To outsiders, whatever their capacity to physically thwart an opponent, Masters such as Dennis Brown, Chan Poi, and Pan Ching Fu may seem like museum pieces, relics of an ancient Eastern tradition with little relevance to contemporary society. Yet the fundamental principles, the disciplined training, the ethical values, and the strict codes of honor that help the Shaolin warriors master themselves and achieve enlightenment are as valid today as they were back then. In the words of Tung Shan, if you look for the truth outside yourself, it gets farther and farther away. Yet when you achieve that perfect harmony of mind and body and can control your chi, the result is a great spiritual awakening, the state that the ancient sages of China called Tanwa. I have this great creative and spiritual force within me that is greater than truth greater than ambition, greater than confidence, greater than determination, or than vision. It is all these combined, and there is no feeling to which this experience can be compared. Bruce Lee. From the Shaolin Temple, to training halls in the West, disciples of Kung Fu the world over learn that the search for truth and freedom begins and ends with themselves. And the hardest warrior to conquer is always the warrior within.